I'm Drew Taylor and welcome into another edition of Valpo Sports Night here on VU TV. On today's show, the football team struggles again and we'll also discuss replacement officials in the NFL. First things first though, let me introduce my guest today, Brock Gallion, sports analyst for VU TV and Andrew Stem, WVUR sports broadcaster. Guys, the volleyball team goes one and one over the weekend, but looking individually now, who do you think the MVP of the season is so far? Right now, I have to go with and I'm hoping Brock's going to talk about some of the outside hitters and talk about Taylor Root. I'm going to take a slightly different approach and talk about freshman setter Kelsey Barrington. Okay. 331 assists, and Ellen Vandenberg, Morgan Bile, they've been awesome on the outside, but they can't get all those kills if you don't have a setter coming in and setting them up. And Barrington comes in as a freshman out of Michigan, 331 assists, and she has really done a fantastic job of stepping up and setting up those hitters so that they can pick up these kills. Big shoes to fill with Jenny Picorni graduating Absolutely. as well. Absolutely, and she's done a pretty solid job so far this year. Absolutely. Yeah, I agree with him. I think she's done an excellent job. But I, he, I'm going to touch on Morgan Beale. She, uh, I mean, she's leading the team in kills per, per set per each match so far. And then, of course, Taylor Root, player of the, like our team last year, just holding the team down. And this year, I mean, having her... Four point whatever eight six I think it is per digs per get per set right now, but I also like um, I was looking at Taylor Sarah Dooms this year. She's actually um, second on the team and or third on the team in kills right now, and also second on the team in digs. So I mean she's still holding her weight around the team. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, what do you guys think of the potential inconsistency through the Horizon League? I mean you look at the big one over IU and winning the Hoosier Classic a weekend ago. Then you come in you you would think kicking off Horizon League play. To get that big spur, uh, you know, spurt of energy, go 2-0 and in that first road trip, didn't happen. Are you worried about the inconsistency at all? You know, maybe a little bit. I mean, it's kind of, you look at the makeup of the team, and there are a couple of seniors, you know, Mary Dent and Taylor Root, and uh, one, two, one or two other members of the senior class. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, it's a lot of juniors, a lot of sophomores, and some sure. few freshmen. So I think when you're getting players to step into new roles, like you're seeing Vandenberg play more and Morgan yep. Bile is playing more and getting more time on the outside, you're going to kind of have that inconsistency. We talked about the freshman setter. And, you know, as the team's still coming together, kind of developing that cohesion, mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, they played well down in Bloomington and, uh, you know, a split early on, but you really you want to see them playing well in late October, getting set to November when the conference tournament rolls around. And, you know, I think there's still a chance for that cohesion to come together. Okay, let's move on, guys. Uh, the women's soccer team, they split on their California road trip this weekend. Uh, what's been more impressive this year, however, the defense or the offense? I mean, personally, I think uh, the defense has just done a great job this year. I think we are a defensive team. Um, we've outscored our opponents 11-6 to 6 so far this year. And um, we've also only, we've, we've got 53 corner kicks on offensive side, which is phenomenal for us, mm -hmm. and holding only to 35 corner kicks against so, I mean, I, I really do think the defensive side is our strong point this year. That's a good point. Kristen Mansky. I absolutely agree with them. Kristen yeah, Mansky, six shutouts phenomenal. already yep. this year. She's been absolutely stellar in goal. And, and the thing I think people who don't follow soccer religiously kind of fail to understand is that, you know, in soccer there can be one good set piece. That's really all you need. One excellent corner kick, a good cross, and that can be the difference if you've got that big-time defense. Where, you know, you look at football, and it's not going to be just one touchdown that's going to be the difference sure. in a game more than likely. You aren't going to win a game 7 to nothing very often. You know, occasionally in baseball or softball, there will be a big home run that will carry you through. But for the most part, soccer, you just need one good set piece. And right. if you can basically tell your offense, I'm going to limit the, the other team to at most one goal. So all you need to go out is you need to get me one, perhaps to get a tie, or if you can score two and get a, we're almost guaranteed to win. Right. You know mm -hmm. that's kind of a big thing you can get. You know sometimes you can't say you know I need you to score me three or four goals because I'm going to give up a few. But Mansky, only allowing six goals all year, has basically mm -hmm. said if you score me one goal, we're going to be in the game, and there's a good shot we're going to win. And that's been so impressive right. for this team yeah. this year. It's not just Mansky; it's been a collective effort. But absolutely, I mean let's yeah. be let's be honest here. She's Kristen Mansky has been the anchor of this defense already. Uh, was awarded Horizon League Defensive Player of the Week one time this year. I'm sure she'll get it uh, plenty more times throughout the season. Uh, let's move on to the men, guys. Uh, they tied Loyola on Saturday, nil-nil. Are you satisfied with the result? Remember, this is a Loyola team that came into Brownfield last year in the Horizon League Championships and upset the Valpo Crusaders. So are you satisfied with the tie, or were you looking for more of a revenge factor there? You, you know, I think kind of along the lines of what the volleyball team exper is experiencing right now, there was such an influx of talent that kind of came out, and then, you know, there were a lot of seniors who graduated last year, a lot of guys who were coming in new. Mm -hmm. 
Offense has struggled to find their footing a little bit, one five and two so far. But you know, Kyle Zobeck in the back of the net again doing sort of the same thing that Mansky is doing, sure. trying to limit those goals. They've lost a few games, two to one and one nothing. So if the offense can continue, kind of start to build on things as the the Horizon League season really gets going, I don't think this tie against Loyola will be a problem. Yeah, I think the um, goals will come as the season moves on. I think it was a tough opening game for us in the conference to open against Loyola. But I just think um, they keep playing their game from here. I, I think we can only go up. The luxury the that both the, the men and women team have is great goalkeeping. I know we we talked on it talked on about it before, but again, Mansky for the women and Zobek for the men. I mean, that's those are your anchors. Again, that's that's such a luxury to have. And then the offense, I think, will come as the season goes on when the freshmen get acclimated and they start getting some things going up front. But uh, let's move on to the football team. Some darker news here. The 0-1. Uh, now they're now 0-1 Pioneer Football League play. They suffered a 51-14 to loss at the hands of San Diego. What's more concerning, the rushing attack or rush defense? I really think it's the rush defense. Um, I, I think right now our passing game has been decent. Um, Hoffman's yep. been throwing some passes here and there. He's getting some touchdowns. I mean, our rushing attack, it does help open a passing game, but since we have had success with the passing game, I think we need to be able to stop the other team and get the ball back and get our defense off the field. Mm -hmm. Our defense just spent way too much time on the field, and giving up that many yards just shows that they're just getting beat down throughout the game. And there's a correlation between the lack of rushing attack and time of possession. I mean, it's pretty brutal. Yeah. Uh, Crusader defense is out there 35, 36 minutes of the 60 total, total minutes, and then on Saturday, outrushed 227 to 34. That yeah. can't happen. Yeah, no, it can't. And while you look at it, I think teams averaging like 240 rushing yards a game, and um, they're converting more than 50% on third down. And when you can rush the ball well on first and second down and have third and short, it's much easier to do that. And like Brock was saying, you know, the defense has been out on the field a long time. And uh, they, the defense has markedly improved from where they were a year ago. But, I mean, it, you pointed out you spent 35 minutes on the field. You're <laughs> going to give up points. That's just the it's unfortunate way it is. You know, you give up long drives. And then without the Crusader ability to sustain a rushing attack, then, you know, if you go one, two, three kick, then the defense is right back out on the field. So yeah. there is kind of a correlation, but more so troubling has got to be the rush defense right now. Got to try and get the defense off the field. See, I've been firm. I'm kinda, I kind of, I want to disagree with you a little bit. I've been firm on the sense that because of the la of the time of possession disparity, that the defense isn't as poor as the numbers oh, sure. would indicate. Mm -hmm. So I think if the offense picks itself up, and then it's more of a split down the middle, 30-30 time of possession. I think you see the opposing score go down a little bit. Mm -hmm. You see the defense more rested and ready to go get at it on the defensive well, end. It will be interesting to see where these numbers are you know, five or six weeks right. from now once they've gotten into the heart, really, of PFL play. I mean, the schedule's had something to do with it. Youngstown State could run the ball at will with their 65 scholarships. Duquesne with the scholarship, same mm -hmm. type of thing. And, P and San Diego, kind of the class right now, the PFL. So once you get a chance you know, to see Butler and homecoming in a couple weeks and some of those other games, hopefully right. those numbers come back a little bit more to earth and there's a little bit more of a balance there. Quickly before the break, we're four weeks in. How many wins do the Crusaders get at the end of the season? I'm hoping us to get at least one win on the season. I think we can do it. You think uh, one? I think they, their first game of the year, they looked like they could actually get a win against St. John. They look good, yeah. And um, I think they'll find their they'll find that niche again in the season, and they'll at least get one win this year. I like three. I think okay. but, I think they get Butler at homecoming. Like the optimism. Uh, Campbell, <laughs> and then they got Davidson, Moorhead. There are a couple other winnable games in there. I really feel like they don't play Jacksonville. And Jacksonville, other than Drake, Jacksonville, Drake, and San Diego, really the class of the PFL. And I think once you get beyond that, Really, there are a lot of really competitive games, so probably not a chance to go out there and compete for a full four quarters against Drake, but I think anybody else in the conference, they can go ahead and give it a run at. Fair enough. We'll wrap up the discussion there. When we come back, it seems that we've reached a tipping point with the replacement officials in the NFL. We'll discuss that and more right here on Valpo Sports Night. Hi everybody, I'm Dick Vitale of ESPN, and I'm on VU TV. It's awesome, baby, with a capital A.
back on Valpo Sports Night. Again, joined by Brock Gallion, VU TV sports analyst, and Andrew Stem, WVUR sports broadcaster. Guys, another week in the books means more scrutiny for these replacement referees around the NFL. When, if at all, do we see this lockout end? Well, here's the important question. Did you watch the games on Sunday? Watch them all. Did you watch the games on Sunday? <laughs> all of them, yep. I watched some of the games on Sunday, and really the matter of business is as long as people continue to watch the product, as much as guys like Al Michaels and Chris Collinsworth and all the other announcers want to harp on, them on how difficult mm -hmm. the officials are, as long as people continue to turn in and watch TV and continue to go to the stadiums and continue to do that, the NFL doesn't have a whole lot of reason realistically to go out and try and force the lockout to end. I mean, it's not probably as high quality a product as you would get with the regular referees, but referees are still, you know, human one way or the other, so it's mm -hmm. not as though all of these mistakes would still not be happening. You still have sure. to assume that there are some there. Now, some are more forgivable than others, unfortunately, but I feel like the NFL is in a pretty strong bargaining position. They don't have to say, you know, we need this in order to greatly improve the quality of it because people are still watching in record numbers, people are still going out to stadiums, and until something like that happens where people stop watching games all of a sudden, I don't think Roger Goodell is in any major hurry to say, you know what, we need to get these guys back. Okay. I hate to say it, but I think uh, what's going to take to get these rough back is there's going to be a full-out brawl on the field one of these times. <laughs> I mean, you watched the game, the night game last night. First two minutes of the game, there was probably two skirmishes on the thing, a couple guys throwing jabs at each other, and the refs didn't even flag them once. Um, I'm just thinking one of these times that someone's going to break out and just have a fight on the field, and the NFL is going to have to do something about it because these refs aren't going to flag them for it or anything like that. So I think both sides are at fault here. The referees are making 170, 180000 as a part-time job with benefits, I might add. Uh, that's a pretty good deal. Yep. Yeah. On, the other, yeah. on the other side, the referees are not looking at the dollar amount they're making. Mm -hmm. They're thinking, well, the NFL is a billion-dollar industry. I want more of that piece of the pie. I feel like they think they deserve more of a percentage, mm -hmm. not necessarily mm -hmm. more dollar amount. Right. Mm -hmm. So who is necessarily to blame here? Who needs to give? It, it's ultimately, it's going to have to be both sides, I think. Yeah. The NFL is going to decide, I would assume, as the playoffs roll around, if not before then, as the late as the games as it gets later into the season mm -hmm. and not that with only a 16 game schedule not every every game is meaningful but sure. as it gets into november and december and the games become more and more meaningful in terms of impacting playoff Absolutely. spots and things like that i think you'll see the nfl start to go we got to get these guys back and i think you'll see the full-time referees go you know we're going to have to budge on this a little bit because we want to be out there working we want to get some better benefits but we need to you know get back out on the field and be working and i think eventually around Thanksgiving. If not, before that'll be when everybody comes together and says, all right, let's do this and get back out on the field. Yeah, I completely agree with him. Um, both sides are going to have to budge on this because both sides are going to want, they're going to want a little bit too much that either side wants to give. So they're both going to have to give a little bit. But I, I agree with him. Around Thanksgiving, I think, is, just, is when the NFL is going to have to look at it and actually but try to make But good in terms of after last year, where you were able to see when it was the players, both sides come together. Whereas mm -hmm. you look at somewhere like the NHL, where they've gone through that lockout previously, and I know the referees and the players mm -hmm. aren't the same thing, but mm -hmm. the NHL has a different sort of stance in terms of we're willing to let it go all the way, and I think the NFL has already shown that bargaining to come together with the players right before last season, and I mm -hmm. think eventually you'll see both sides come together. And One final point on this uh, I want to add is, even when the replacement refs make the correct call, they're still going to get scrutinized. They're, at a, they're in a lose-lose situation right now because even if they make the absolutely right call, they're still going to get heat from the other side, and the coaches are almost using them as a scapegoat. You saw Bill Belichick try to grab a referee a, on his way out of the stadium mm -hmm. last night. So they're using these referees as a scapegoat, and I feel terrible for them, and it's not their fault. Right. I mean, they're just yeah. trying to make some money. They, they, wanted, they got the opportunity to, you know, to move up in their profession. I can't blame them, but these bo both sides, they need to budge because yeah. for the benefit yeah. of the game, they're, the NFL is taking a huge PR hit here. Sure. Yeah. Uh, and you mentioned the sales still up. Yes, but PR-wise, I think they're going down. Absolutely. The image of Roger Goodell is just tanking by the minute, oh. is it not? No, yes. no completely. It absolutely yeah. is. All right, uh, let's agree. move on here to football in the college ranks. What was the biggest statement uh, win by a college football team that was ranked over the weekend? Uh, I'm going to have to go with Florida State over Clemson. Um, they're trailing by seven at the half. Came back in the second half, put up 35 on Clemson D. That's a solid defense from the ACC, and um, I just think they showed the biggest triumph over a great team in the country. I mean, there's a couple other teams that did a great job. You can look at, I don't know if you're going to touch on Kansas State or Oregon or anything like that, but I mean, both of them did a great job. And I mean, you can't forget Notre Dame, Notre Dame yeah. and their win over Michigan, but that's a struggling Michigan offense right now that's, hasn't, that hasn't really proved much this season. Correct. Right. I was going to take both of those. I'll take Kansas State. 
uh, in terms of going into Norman and coming out with a win. Colin Klein looked fantastic and, you know, has really stuck his name out there finally to be considered maybe not the favorite, but along with Geno Smith and a couple other guys, one of the front runners for the Heisman Trophy and to go in there into Norman and a place where, you know, Big 12 teams have so rarely sure. had success. Mm -hmm. You know, people have mocked Bill Snyder previously for kind of the non-conference schedules that he's put together, but he had success at Kansas State once before and he's doing it again. And they really look to be now the class all of a sudden of that Big 12 and the road to, uh, you know, perhaps the national title game, depending on how things shake out, may end up going through Manhattan, Kansas now all of a sudden. No love for the Oregon Ducks? Uh, the Ducks, you know. <laughs> that's my pick. I mean, they, that, they, that's, that's perfectly, yeah. you know, they absolutely handed it to Ray 49 Rodriguez. 49-0. Nothing. 49 nothing, yes. And, you know, it was impressive enough to jump in front of LSU right. mm -hmm. and all of a sudden kind of take perhaps for at least the moment the possibility of there being a rematch of Alabama-LSU yep. again in the national title game off the table. Mm -hmm. And they looked awfully good. Yeah, they looked awfully, awfully good. I tuned into that game. They just look on a on a different level. I mean, the, yeah. the speed of the game that the Oregon Ducks play at. They're averaging 303 rush yards a game. Yeah. I mean, can you imagine? I mean, we talk about Valpo football's uh, <laughs> rushing struggles, but Oregon does not have any of that. I mean, they're they're. Uh, they're reeling on all cylinders here, and I, I'm very impressed. They're my national championship. I mean, you got to also look at their defense, too, just because Arizona is a team that's usually well-known for their offense. Right. I mean, this year they might be a little bit down, but they're still a ranked team, and they still probably have an offense that could be up there. So, yeah, for sure. So. Guys, when we come back, we'll break down the wild card standings and the rest of the playoff push around Major League Baseball. That and more next on Valpo Sports Night. I'm Matthew Barnard and I'm on VU TV. I'm Vince Liuto and I'm on VU TV. I'm Becky Vinema and I'm on VU TV. Hi, I'm Professor Powell. And I'm Lauren Whitney Gottbreath. And, and you're on, on VU TV. Hi, I'm Michael Graves and I'm on VU TV. Hi, I'm Pastor Jim and I'm on VU TV. We're Voobox and we're on VU TV. I'm Logan Cohen and I'm on VU TV. Hi, I'm Veronica Heckler and I'm on VU TV. Hey, I'm Kevin Deitch and I'm on VU TV. Back here on Valpo Sports Night for our final segment of the program, our quick hit section. Again, Brock and Andrew joining alongside. Guys, who are, the, who are your five National and five American League teams that you see making the playoffs here, this final push in September through October? Okay. The American League, the Yankees, mm -hmm. the Orioles, okay. the Rangers. Yep. I think the Angels are going to overtake the A's. I've looked at the schedule a little bit. The Angels have six games left against Seattle and the A's have to play the Rangers seven times. Rangers still battling out, trying to get that Absolutely. top spot in the American League. So they still have a lot to play for, even though the division pretty close to being clinched. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, with Brett Anderson getting hurt and kind of some of the struggles that the A's have had recently in terms of who the players that they've had go down here, and it seems like the last week or so they've had a couple of pitchers get hurt and things like that. You know, they've been a phenomenal story, but I think the Angels with Mike Trout and, uh, you know, Albert Pujols just kind of push over that edge here at the end, but uh, okay. you know they've got to still, I think, and they're done playing each other. So now it's all dependent upon what happens left against who they, how they fare against okay. other teams. Um, and unfortunately, in the American League Central, in a team, in a battle of two teams, neither of one wants to really win the division. Um, in spite of the fact that I love the Tigers, I do think it's going to be the White Sox who come out just a little bit ahead, okay. um, mostly because they have nine games left at home or ten games left at home. Yep. And the Tigers have to finish on the road. They have a tough road. Just they have three more at home, and then they're on the road for seven. So, you, you know. It kind of feels like two guys who are sort of gone to a knife or have gone to a gunfight with a pair of plastic knives. Sure, They're just sure. kind of duking yeah. it out against each other for somebody probably to be a sacrificial lamb in the first round of playoffs. But I just see the White Sox nosing them out. Okay. Brock, we'll go for you for the American, and then we'll go back to the National for you. Um, I agree with him completely on most of them. I'm going to go with Oakland, though, over the as, 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 as the right. uh, wildcard team. I, it's more of a I just want to see them in the playoffs. I kind of want to see what they could do if they can get to that spot. Um, I do think the Angels are very strong, and I do think it's going to be tough for the Oakland to hold them out for the rest of the season. 
but I do think they can do it. Um, and then I'm going to agree with him on the White Sox as well for the AL Central. They're going to hold on there. They're going to hold on. They kind of teeter a little yeah, bit. Yeah, they got the young pitching and stuff like that right yeah. now. They got some young pitching. And um, I just I do think they're going to be able to hold on for the rest of the season. Okay. Detroit's been a little inconsistent this year. Oh, they, yeah, they're, like yeah, yeah, yeah. If you want if you want to say it their way, yeah. um, so I I just think yeah I think the White Sox can be able to hold on. Okay, national. Okay. Washington, Atlanta, yeah. Cincinnati, good, yeah. San Francisco. Those are pretty easy. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, unfortunately, the way things kind of played out, I'm going to have to go St. Louis over your Brewers. It's fine. And Milwaukee gave a great run at it yeah. and just kind of ran out of steam. And unfortunately, the schedules didn't line up right. They had to go and play the Nationals Four while games. the Cardinals were playing the Cubs. And the Cubs blew a couple of you know what would have been key wins yeah. for them. They didn't come back on Friday, but then yeah. lost one on Saturday. And yeah. uh, you know, just the Brewers still have to play the Reds, and the Cardinals have a few more games against the Astros. The schedule just lines up a little bit better. If the season were maybe 15 games longer, and the Brewers had a shot to play the Cardinals some more, I feel like they could catch them, but without having an opportunity to play them anymore. Yeah, they're running out of games. They're running yeah, out yeah, of games. Yeah. They need the season to last probably another 15 days. They've okay. put in a spirited effort since the middle of August, sure, but yeah. it's going to come just a little bit short. Yeah. Brock? I have to agree with him on that one. Um, yeah, I think the Cardinals are going to be the last spot in the wild card. They're going to clinch it. Um, I know the Braves the, are, and the yeah. Braves, yeah. yeah. I mean, I, wild card and Braves in uh, St. Louis, but I, mm -hmm. Braves are a little bit ahead of that St. Sure. Louis right now. So I do think St. Louis is going to be that last wild card spot, and then of course, the other three that have clinched already. So. Sure. Um, guys, going forward, we talked about the teams that have had success, uh, talking about playoff runs and all that. Now I want to talk about the bad, and specifically the coaches. Uh, which coaches in your mind and which managers are on the hot seat? Want to take that first? Yeah, I mean, uh, it's Ozzie Gaines' first year in Miami. Um, they had <laughs> a little... His only year? <laughs> Could be. Could be. That's what I'm saying. Um, okay. He... Uh, he, they, they were kind of have an optimistic outlook this year, going to the new stadium, have sure the new, new look Marlins. It was they were hyping it up a lot, and then the team kind of just fell apart with injuries to Gene Carlos Stanton and some other areas. And he, uh, I, I think he might be on the hot seat this in the off season, just so. get some scrutiny. I, I don't think he might. I don't think he'll be out of the job yet. But because of this first year there, having a tough year, I think he will be on the hot seat. He hasn't helped his cause with some of his comments no. either. I might add. But he he never did that in Chicago either. Right, but he was he was established. He won a World Series. Yeah. Some of these Miami fans are looking at this guy and saying, "Look at this is your first year here, and you're gonna mm -hmm. mouth off, and you're not gonna even back it up with production." Sure, it's true. Um, well, I assume Bobby Valentine has just sort of understood <laughs> already. Yes. Um, so I, I, I have to think it could be a couple of American League managers who have gotten their teams to the World Series in the past. Mm -hmm. I think you look at Mike Sosha out in Anaheim, I think so, and you huh? look at Jim Leland in Detroit, and I think you look at the rosters and the lineups that these two guys were given. And, you know, Social probably has a little bit more leeway because he's got a World Series title, even though Leland Absolutely. has gotten the Tigers to World Series but hasn't done it back. They were the favorites to win the American League Central. They, people were talking about winning 95 games. At least. And, you know, yeah. if they don't win the AL Central, I think he might be done. And I don't know if they would fire Sosha if they don't make the playoffs this year after signing Pujols and sort of all the C.J. Wilson and some of the other moves that they went out and made. But I feel like if they don't get to the playoffs this year, if Oakland's able to hold them off for that wild card spot, that – his seat will definitely be a lot warmer next year if he comes back to managing Anaheim. Is this a growing trend with coaches being fired? And like I mentioned scapegoat earlier in the program, but these general managers just using them as the reason and putting them out there, firing coaches so easily because that's the reason. They're pinpointing that's the one reason why we didn't make it to the postseason. I mean, I mean it, it's hard when you do something like that, but I think you kind of feel as though, you know, when you look at these teams with giant payrolls, mm -hmm. and you know, when they're spending upwards of 140, 150 million dollars, you know, you're expected yeah, to get to the playoffs. Times. And I know more teams are spending more, but when you go on the off, spend, off season spending sprees like the Angels went on, mm -hmm. and like the Tigers went on, especially when you look at the AL West, and you weren't really expecting Oakland to come out of anywhere. Mm -hmm. You figure Anaheim and the it was going to be Anaheim and the, the Rangers sure. battling out for the AL West all year, and they've been so disappointing for so long. And the same thing with the Tigers. They got hot early in April and then really faded, and then it's kind of been up and down. And I think that when you look at those inconsistencies, that's kind of something you pinpoint on the manager. And you know, this may be a case where you may get general managers being shown the door to ownership so. may just decide to clean house and start mm -hmm. again. So, seems like the level of expectation for fans, media, everybody involved has just increased. There's no such thing mm -hmm. as uh, just having a good year, finishing 500. It's it's playoffs or in, in some cases World Series or bust yeah. with some of these teams. And the level of expectation has really opened the door for a lot of these coaches to get the boot, in my mind. Well, uh, and I think part of that, too, is, though, you look at this new wild card and that has added an true. extra spot. Yeah. And now a third of your league, or even more than that in the case of the American League this year, five out of 14 teams who play in the American League are going to make the playoffs. 
And you know, with those odds, I think there is increased expectations that you can get there. And some teams, you know, when you fall short of that, especially with preseason expectations, right. you know, that's where it's going to come down. All right, guys. Last question before we close up shop: uh, the biggest surprise through three weeks in the National Football League. I mean, you got to look at the Cardinals first sure. of all. Just their defense has been phenomenal, giving up the least amount of points in the league through the first three weeks of the season, only giving up 40 points through the first three weeks. Um, I just think that's a phenomenal job that they've done there. Um, Kevin Cobb's finally starting to play the way that they hoped he'd play through mm -hmm. the first couple weeks of the season. Their defense has just been phenomenal. Now I'll take a look and I'll go with the reverse in terms of a negative surprise. The New England Patriots are one and two. Okay. And, you know, I know you can't really say if the playoffs were to start now three weeks into the season. But, I mean, nobody expected them, I think, to be one and two, including a loss to Brock's mm -hmm. Arizona Cardinals, talking about kind of how those things have Absolutely. been. You know, and then they lose last night by a point to the Ravens. And just, this is a team that was in the Super Bowl a year ago and was expected to be up at the top of the class of the AFC again and still could get there. But, you know, right now, they've been pretty disappointing until you look at the New Orleans Saints. 0-3 yeah. so far, last in the yeah. NFC South. You know, maybe the Bounty Gate suspensions have really hit them or, you know, it's hard to exactly know what's going on. Maybe they really miss Sean Payton. But for whatever reason, you know, two teams who've been to the Super Bowl recently and if big things were expected them this year have really faded backwards. Guys, we'll close things up there. I want to thank Brock Gallion, VU TV Sports Analyst, and Andrew Stem, WVUR Sports Broadcaster. To stay up to date on all your Crusader sports, log on to ValpoAthletics.com. Thank you for watching. We'll see you next time here on Valpo Sports Night.